Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the YouTubers Hamfest. Uh, wherever you are, and we're very uh, looking for. Well, we're looking forward to the program that we've got today coming up, and I'm sure that we've got plenty of great YouTube content related to Ham Radio this morning and throughout the whole day. Of course, we've still got two days of the Hamfest to go. I hope you enjoyed yesterday, uh, Friday, and um, there was uh, plenty of things on and plenty more to come. That's for sure. Well, today in this uh, video, I've got uh, Tim, G5TM, here uh, to discuss some antennas and some operating portable and sporadic key and all sorts of stuff this morning. So we've got a little bit of a tech presentation. So uh, just introduce yourself there, Tim. I know you've got a YouTube channel. I've seen uh, a few of your videos and uh, you're doing quite a good job with those. So yeah, give us a bit of an intro and uh, what your interests are in the hobby and all that sort of stuff. Well, thanks, Hayden, for asking me along, and uh, pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, great to be here. I mean, my, my passion really is uh, portable and mobile um, and operating sort of near the sea. I'm lucky enough to live about a five-minute drive from the shoreline, so that's a bit of a bonus, and uh, making up antennas as well to go portable and mobile with. So that's really where my passion lies, by op operate at home as well. But that's where my passion really lies and sort of the higher HF bands as well. So that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. Oh, great. And is, is that sort of the stuff that you do on your channel that you focus on? Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, I do a lot of stuff where I'm operating mobile and portable. Um, recently, I've done a lot of antenna bills as well. Very simple antenna bills because I'm no way am I a practical person, believe me. I mean, you don't see many shells being put up by me, to be honest. So uh, I do a lot of stuff on sort of portable and mobile antennas and uh, maybe discuss a few of those, some ideas. Um, which are really, which are really easy to make. It just require literally a roll of coax and uh, a PL two five nine. So hopefully that will be of interest to some people anyway. Yep, that's great. So we'll uh, we'll definitely be going into that um, in today's uh, video, and and I'm sure, like uh, as we've seen in the Hamfest, we've had some uh, technical related articles, but uh, technical related articles, technical related videos, but this one hopefully will be a, a nice basic one for those who are just maybe getting started in the hobby and just want to, you know, some nice simple antennas for, as you say, for portable. So would this be interest, interesting for those to do sort of SOTA and, and POTA and those sort of portable activities as well? Yes, indeed. I mean, the antennas I'm going to talk about, or a couple of ones I made, are, are monobanders, but they're they're N-fed, a bit of the half waves, not N-fed half waves. They're, they're half wave antennas, which you can literally put up a, a squid pole, a fiberglass pole, very easily. That's how I use it. So, uh, for example, the uh, the 10 meter version, you can put up a 7 meter squid pole very easily. The 20 meter version, probably need a 12 meter pole for that. Uh, and there's a 15 meter and a 17 meter version. So they're very easy to deploy. You just co you coil them up, put them in the rucksack and they're quite easy to use. So um, I can show you a couple of examples in a minute of, of a couple I've made. And uh, they're very easy to use and very easy, easy to deploy. And they probably cost somewhere around $10, 10 pounds to, to make. So they're, they're quite, quite easy and quite cheap to make as well. Ah, excellent. All right. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll put a link to your uh, channel in the description for low, uh, below. So make sure that you go and uh, check out Tim's channel and uh, give him a subscribe and go and watch all of his videos. I'm sure there's plenty of uh, interesting <laughs> stuff for everybody on the on your channel. So that's great. All right. So uh, let's uh, have a chat about your monoband coaxial antennas. Okay, so um, I've got a couple of examples here. Now, the, the, the way they're made is pretty straightforward. In fact, I mean, uh, there's a design, which I think one of your countrymen came up with. I can't remember what it's called now. It's the, it's the flower pot antenna for two meters. You've probably come across that. Yes, probably made. Have, you, have, you, have you made one? Have you tried to make one? Have you yes, one? I have. So I've made quite a few of them. The the amateur in question, uh, unfortunately, is a silent key just recently. Oh, I see. Uh, John VK2ZOI. Uh, but yes, his his website uh, on the flower pot antennas uh, is still up and uh, and is available. And yes, I've made them for. Uh, I think I've made the dual band version for two meters and seventy centimeters. And I've also done one for six meters, and I and I did a video on that too, and and it was a, a very good, very good performing antenna for just a piece of coax. So, absolutely, and the the, the same design is basically incorporated in, in the um, the HF versions, if you like. So the two meter version, as you recall, is basically a strip of coax, and as I'll show you in a minute, you basically just cut away the uh, the outer. Uh, okay, um, the outer layer and the uh, the inner braid leave the inner dielectric and that's half of it and the other half is the untouched coax and all you have to do then and the trick with them is to make sure you get your choke right to make sure you do the right choke 
uh, at, at the bottom of the antenna. And what that does, as you, as you probably know, it, it chokes off the uh, any any RF to come back down. So basically, the antenna is literally then what's above the choke, and half of it's going to be the untouched coax, and the other half is literally just the inner dielectric, and that is a half wave. Now that is literally going to radiate and act just like a half wave dipole. Uh, except, of course, with a half-wave dipole, if you feed it with coax in the middle with a vertical dipole, you've basically got to feed it with the, uh, the transmission line going at least a quarter wave perpendicular, which can be a problem to run that coax like that away from the antenna. It can create problems with weight and everything else. But with this, of course, you've got the happy knowledge that the coax just continues down the poles. You haven't got that weight pulling on the antenna. So even though it's electrically a half-wave center-fed dipole, in practical terms, it's an NFED. So mm. it's got that sort of hybrid sort of nature to it, if you like. Yeah. And I think the one you mentioned that um, that gentleman made, the, uh, the the dual band, is that the one that had like the uh, the aluminium foil on the outside that made it uh, resonate on 70 as well? Yeah. I think it had that design, didn't it? Yeah. So I think he yeah, I think he called that a, a sort of a, a collinear type of uh, antenna arrangement. But yeah, you you have a, a bit of aluminium foil I think around the outside of the PVC pipe that you use to mount the antenna in, um, and and he's got all of the the dimensions and things on if he, on his website if you want to build them. I think he's even got a. a uh, two of them stacked to, uh, on top of one another, so you can have even more gain, of course. And at two meters and seventy centimeters, you can you can do that uh, when you start to get down towards six meters and even lower. It's a little bit difficult because it becomes a very very long antenna. Um, but one uh, point that I I did want to just touch on with what you were just saying too is so, f I guess for our viewers we're talking about it's still all one piece of coax but the the yeah. probably the most important bit as you as you mentioned is that coil isn't it because everything above that is the antenna and everything below that coil is the feed line is that correct that's absolutely correct and it, it's critical to get that choke right now uh, as well as the design that we've been talking about uh, for the 2 and 70 uh, the main source of information regarding the choke comes from a, from another silent key a g3txq uh, Steve Hunt, I think his name was, and sadly Silent Key, but um, he produced this fantastic chart, which actually gives the uh, the correct way to provide choking for the different frequencies within HF. So he did it according to uh, sort of toroidal chokes, but also he did it according to what we call air wound chokes. Now I've got an example here. I made this one for 15 meters. I don't know if you can see that, and it's a very crude uh, build. Believe me, if I can make this, anyone can make it because <laughs> I've got I've got 10 left thumbs here. Okay, <laughs> um, so literally, if I show you, um, I haven't got it uncoiled, but this this is the top half of the actual radiating bed. As you can see, this is the inner part of the of the coax. Literally, everything stripped away, and then halfway down, the midway point down. So basically, a quarter wave down, if you like. You then got the same bit of coax, which has now been untouched. Okay, until we get down to the bit you've mentioned, Hayden, which is the choke. And this is the important bit. Now, in this case, what the measurement is for 15 meters is, I think it's seven turns of R. It's all RG58, by the way, which is the easiest coax to use because of it's it's able to bend. It's very malleable. You wouldn't want to try this with RG213. No. Even RG8 actually, even eight might be a problem. But um, yeah, so. According to uh, G3TXQ's chart, and it's completely, completely correct, is that um, this is seven turns of RG58 around a 110 millimeter former. Um, so a bit of waste pipe is usually about four and a quarter inches for all the guys in the States, but four and a quarter inches, something like that. And seven turns will provide enough um, choking to stop any stray RF coming back down your feed. And you can put 100 watts through these, by the way. This isn't a QRP antenna. In fact, to be honest, I know people who put a lot more than 100 watts through them. I'm not sure you'll put a kilowatt up them, to be honest. It's RG58. But a couple of hundred watts, these should be able to handle, because they are resonant monoband antennas. You know, an RG58 will take that, basically, on SSB. I'm not sure you want to do that on, on CW or data. Mm. But, um, yeah, and it's, it's chokes off the RF. So all it is is literally seven turns of coax around that sort of 110 mil and then the rest of the feed line you can choose it could be a little pigtail or you could have literally 10 20 meters of coax going into your opening position that's completely up to you of course uh, and that is literally the antenna and as you can see this is it you know you can wind it up much more tightly than i've done it and uh, and that's it for 15 meters now 
this is where there is a bit of a difference because when you go down to 20 meters and by the way i don't think you can really do a, a really good air wound choke for anything lower than 20 meters i don't i think 40 meters is probably a step too far we just get rid of that but when we go down to 20 meters you may the observant amongst you may know that the choke is slightly bigger <laughs> So this is now 15 turns, I think it's 15 turns of RG58 around the same format, 110 mil. And that again will provide the choke. And the only difference is, apart from the much thicker choke, is that you have got more of the radiating elements. So you've got five meters, that's about 16 feet of the strip back coax. And then you've got five meters of the untouched. And again, it goes to the choke, feed line, job done. Now. For those uh, of guys who have been on CB, 11 meters, if I said the, the words and letters T2LT to you, you probably know exactly what this antenna is because a lot of the guys who use portable antennas on 11 meters, on CB, who go up to hilltops and run nets, a lot of them will use the 10 meter version of that on a squid pole, on a fiberglass pole, up it goes. And it performs just as well as any half wave antenna. So you're again, if you're looking at 10 or 11 meters, you're looking at things like the Antron 99, the half wave gain master antennas. And of course, you can compare it to any other dipole for any other band half wave. It's the same. It's a half wave. So it, it does really, really well. It's a mono bander. So you haven't got quite got the same uh, re sort of resonant harmonics as you have with the N fed half waves, for example, when you feed them with a 49 to one. You haven't quite got that but you have got a very, very effective antenna. It does really, really well. And I've used it on, on the um, CQ World, not the CQ Worldwide, or was it, w, was it WPX, the most recent big contest, at the end of March, wasn't it? I can't remember now. Mm. And I had these up for 2015 and 10, and they, they did very, very well because they're a vertical half wave. They're going to do quite well. And get them down by the beach on a squid pole, salt water, vertical, low angle of DX, and you should do very well with them. So, now I, I just you know for what they are they're great you know? yeah and I just saw too so you've got the you've you've made up the coil and you've wound the coil what have you used to hold that coil together have you just used electrical tape or have you used something a bit stronger well is yeah I've, I've done long and hard research on this and you've you've really yeah you've hit the nail on the head I've used tape yeah. <laughs> so what? So what I did, I cut off a short piece of the um, of the pipe because you buy the pipes in sort of two meter length, so we're doing two meters. So I cut off about I don't know that much, whatever that is, six inches, so a bit more than that, eight inches, something like that. And then basically, uh, you start winding it. You have bits of tape to make sure you keep it fast to the pipe. You just keep winding it and keep winding it, apply the tape, and literally do it like that. Now you can, of course, literally cut off a, a, a bespoke piece of pipe and then drill a hole and then feed the coax through a hole and then start to wind it round like that. And I've done that for the two meter version because you only need a very small diameter pipe for the two meter version. Mm -hmm. I built one for four as well, four meters, which works well. So um, and you've done probably done the same for six meters. So you don't, you, you can you can use a bit of actual bit of the pipe to, to, to wind the coil on and attach it. You just need to drill two holes wide enough to allow the coil to be wound around basically. Um, but I've gone down this road to try and lessen the weight a bit, especially with the 20 meter version, because that's a hefty old coil, to be honest with you. Um, but for 15 and, and up or 17 and up, it'll be a quite a lightweight coil, to be honest. So, yeah, you can do it that way. Yeah. And as you mentioned, even though these are monoband antennas, I'm thinking of those who um, might run, if they do run SOTA or they do run um, in for our, uh, those that run POTA as well. They generally, I don't know, but here in Australia, we tend to stick to the 40 metre band at least, but I know that 20 metres is a very popular one and usually that's just the band that you only really need. But even if that is the case, you can make up several of these and you can just have them in the pack, low, lower the squid pole down, put the new one on, put it back up and within a few minutes you're up and running again. Um, how do you attach your uh, those coax antennas to the squid pole? Do you just use tape or is there anything yeah. else? No, it's it's literally that. So some relatively decent insulation tape, electrical tape. Uh, the top bit's the important bit because that's the thin part of the. If you're using the whole pole, obviously we all know that the, the thin top mm. bit of the fiberglass poles, but you've got to be careful about. So I usually have about three or four different uh, attach points there, and then as you go down, perhaps every couple of meters, put a bit of tape, put a bit of tape, and then the critical thing. I can just show the twenty meter version again. Oh. 
is that when you're putting the pole on, what you don't want to do is to leave this hanging because literally you're pulling the pole down, mm. with, and especially with the 20 meter version. So you want to try and make sure that you're just keeping it, you're just supporting the weight of it as you put in the pole up. Now you can put this through the pole if you want to, but the critical thing is when you get to this bit, when it, when you get to the point where you're putting this bit up, having put the, the top bit of the antenna up, is just to make sure you support it and put a bit of tape just above and below the coil so the coil is supported as much as you can. Uh, less of a consideration with the 15 and 10 and 12 and 17 meter versions because the coil is much less heavy, you know. But that's the only thing you've got to watch for with those. If you're doing a 40 meter version, which I've not done, I think by looking at uh, that chart, the G3TXQ chart, you're probably better off going down the road of winding a choker through a toroid for that, because that'll be far, probably far more effective at choking and also will be uh, far. I mean, once you try to do an air round choke like that for 40 meters, you're looking at a really thick unit to carry around with you. Yeah. So a toroid choke is probably the best thing, best approach to use them for that. Yep. Um, we mentioned about 40 meters. Uh, is 40 meters popular in, in Australia because literally it allows you to have that sort of footprint from east to west across the country? Is that because of that or what was the reason, do you think? Yeah, I'm not so sure. I, I, I mean, I, I've only sort of been in the last probably year and a half or, or probably even less, probably the last year I've, I've ventured back onto HF again. And that's the first thing that I've noticed is, is that 40 meters seems to be the most popular HF band, at least during the daytime here. Yeah. 20 meters, not so much. Uh, uh, there's definitely, obviously, there is band activity on 20 meters, but uh, I, I tend to find that those who, especially who are doing SOTA, tend to, to stick to 40 meters. Um, probably, I guess, due to the ease of, you know, you, you're always going to find someone on the band there, no matter what sort of conditions are like. It's it's usually open, at least for local contacts. So, um, but uh, but yeah, they, they tend to stick to 40 uh, quite a bit here. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a great band. At the end of the day, as I say, 40 is going to be open to somewhere most of the day, you know, and uh, it's, it's always a good band to jump on. Uh, it's a good band to cut your teeth on HF as well, I think. I think it's, you've, got, you've got less of the sharp elbows that you get on 10, on 20 metres when you've got the power band. Mm. I think with 40, you've got people who are prepared to do more of a rag chew, and you should be able to get out a thousand, 500, 1,000 kilometres quite easy, really, on 40, shouldn't you, really? Even during the day with decent conditions, you know, you don't need a very high dipole, you know, 20 foot up or something that'll get you and that's why i guess the guys who do a lot of that with the sota uh in, in your neck of the woods with 40 meters yeah talking about 40 meters the only the only commercial antennas i use really when i go portable are nfed half waves yep. I've, I've are you are you a fan of those things? Have you used those yourself? The NFED half waves, the forty nine. Yeah, to so I've built a couple of NFED half waves before, and uh, a couple of the forty nine to one uh, Anons as well. So I think I've I think I've done I've done a couple of videos on my channel to do with the those builds. I, I'm not running that antenna at the moment. I'm actually using another UK product called the DX Commander at the moment. But uh, oh, I've not I, heard of that. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the the NFED works very very well, and it's a very effective um, portable antenna. And one of the ones that I have used for uh, some of my portable operations with the the IC705, and it gets out pretty well. And you and you only need really for that for an NFED antenna, you only need really need one. Uh, and the same with your coax antennas as well is you only need one antenna support as well, just just the single pole, um, because you can have the unin close to your operating position or lower down, and uh, and and it works just as well. I oh, completely agree, and you can deploy them as a sloper, an invert, um, sorry, inverted V, uh, a vertical inverted if you've L. got enough of a support, inverted L, absolutely. Yeah. So you've got that sort of, um, sort of that ability to adjust your sort of uh, configuration, how it fits in with where you are. I mean, the only ones, I mean, I'm, I'm in no way associated with high end fed, but I used the high end fed one here. This is, this is a matchbox. That's 100 watt rated, and that gives me 10, 20, and 40 meters. And that's on a shortened version. It's not a 66 foot wire. It's a, it's a about a 39 foot, about 11.8 meters long, and that goes up my 12 meter pole, uh, spider beam pole, literally as a vertical. And that gives you 10, it doesn't give you all of 40, it gives you about a 80 kilohertz bandwidth of two to one SWR. But if you've got like a tune, but inbuilt tuner in your rig, you can get any, you can get away with most of it anyway. Yeah. And it gives you 20 and 10 meters as well. So that's a nice antenna to use. And uh, you can see with that one, oh, I used one I prepared earlier, not me. Um, probably seeing it as a coil oh god it's all yeah that's the end of the coil there and uh, basically you've got the full halfway for 20 meters and then you've got the coil where is it there 
can see the end of the coil there. And you've got another couple of meters of wire. And that's, that brings you basically into 40 meters. And those antennas are really popular, very popular in small gardens. Uh, when you've got somebody who's got literally only got one vertical support space, not even support for any radials, ground or, you know, any some room for any radials, whether they're ground radials or raised radials, provided you can shove up a 12 meter spider beam, uh, or spider pole or fiberglass pole, you can put one of those up and it'll get you three bands. And in fact, an internal tuner will probably get you 15 and 17 out of it as well, to be honest with you. So yeah. they're, they're good little antennas as well. I enjoy using those. But you, as you say, it, you need to have a 12-meter pole, which isn't the lightest pole in the world to carry around with you. So that's probably where you probably need to have the car to help you with the operating position more than anything else as well. And definitely uh, with the NFED antennas as well, you, as you say, you get that harmonic relationship where you can yeah. use it as a multiband antenna. So if you use a 40-meter uh, NFED, then that will also resonate on uh, 20 meters and 15 meters and yeah. also somewhat on on uh, 10 meters as well so yes um you can uh, yeah if you've got a tuner in your radio it makes it a lot easier too so um absolutely uh, yeah, yeah great it does. antennas yeah yeah they are I mean, they're just easy to deploy the single wire you know um there's, there's so many there's so many sort of um choices you've got out there really for portable isn't there but i think keeping it simple is, is great and and you know i think having a, a single vertical support makes a heck of a difference i think as well in terms of having that ease ease to deploy it not having to sort of put wires out everywhere i know the dx command is a very good product a lot of people like using the courtway verticals with the ground radials i think you know providing you've got the time to to deploy it and the space i think that works very well too it's just what your personal situation's like isn't it so yeah absolutely and- I always like the words of uh, – now, I always say that they're the words of. I'm sure that other people have used them before. Uh, if you've seen uh, Steve KM9G's channel, Temporary Offline, Steve always says – The best hand is the one you have in the air. He's completely uh, correct there. Um, one so of the other is. things that I also wanted to say was I'm very, very happy that you've been using kilometers and imp- and metric measurements on, on this discussion. <laughs> we didn't discuss uh, uh, backstage about that, so that was quite a nice no. surprise. I've um, had many comments on my videos in the past, Aiden. It's, it's one of those things that's been drummed into me for the last 12 months. <laughs> you should be using meters. So I'm trying to sort of give imperial and metric as much as I can. So there we are. I, Sorry. I, I always like saying, oh, so uh, I had good DX on the 30 foot band. And they say, 30 foot <laughs> band? What are you talking about? Oh, it's, t- it's 10 meters. What are you talking about? <laughs> Um, and the other thing that I also noticed is you've got a Manchester United Cup. Um, so I would like to say commiserations because I am a Manchester yeah. fan. However, it is a Manchester City fan. So, <laughs> oh well, John, but these these things can be cured. It's wonderful. It's, it's amazing what the medical profession can do. By the way, if I can just say this is probably the only cup we'll get our hands on this year. So I'll just get that out of the way before you say it. Hey. I thank you very much indeed. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have agreed to speak to you. But there we are. That's fine. Um, oh, that's yeah. Right. So. Yeah, so mate, at the end of the day, you know, I think... It's a bit the, like the talking, bed... I'm not sure if you're a cricket fan, it's a bit like talking oh, about yeah. the Ashes, isn't yeah. it? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I've, 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 have any of you players been done the DIY store lately? You know, let's go down that road. Right, we, uh... you, know I'm coming, you, you know where I'm coming from. Sorry about the American guys, this is about cricket. This is alien yeah, to the American yes, boys. Yes, okay. yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an Australian and English thing with uh, with with the cricket. We're, uh, it's fierce, fierce rivalry, fierce rivalry, once, once a Ooh. summer. Absolutely. Well, so, yeah, once the summer, it well, lasts forever. This coming up. That's right. Is it November, December time or something, isn't it? So, yes, and I uh, believe I'll, I'll be it's, staying up. Yeah. It'll be played be in Australia up, this year. That's right. I'll be staying up late to see the, the collapse, and I'll be going to bed <laughs> in the bathroom. Um, as it always happens. Um, we'll be down yeah, at the so, hardware store. <laughs> getting the sandpaper so we, uh, we need we need to just we need to say that for our american viewers we do apologize so what we're talking about is a uh <laughs> is a sporting scandal that happened with the australian players uh as as an australian cricket fan i can say that i was completely horrified when that happened so <laughs> as was most fans but anyway that's uh that that's that so <laughs> let's move on it's in the past Tate. it's gone it's gone leave it oh dear sorry right, you were good saying. man no, that's right. I mean, um, I think one of the benefits of going mobile and portable, of course, is getting away from the noise. I don't know what it's like at your your QTH. Terrible. What's the uh, okay? Yeah, that's what most people say. <laughs> I mean, I, um, I'm I'm relatively lucky. I mean, I, I I'm surrounded by houses, so I'm in no way in the middle of nowhere. Um, I've got about an S5 noise floor on 40, which I'm so very whereabouts happy about. in whereabouts in the UK are you exactly? 
Sorry, yes. I mean, I'm in a county called West Sussex, which is on the south coast, uh, central southern coast of England. So I'm about 100 kilometres, what's that, 60 odd miles southwest of London. Mm -hmm. I'm about a 10 minute drive from the from the coast. So I'm lucky in that respect. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm in a typical sort of semi urban area. Um, so we're in a cul-de-sac of about 11 houses here. Um, excuse me. So I've got houses behind, houses in front, houses next to me. So I'm lucky in that respect that my noise floor is fairly low, but I, I'm under no illusion though. Things are going to creep up and I'm in, under no illusion. It just takes one dodgy charger, one uh, one device can wipe out the whole of the spectrum. So I, we're kind of all on borrowed time at home, aren't we really with HF? Most mm. of us, we're kind of, we're kind of one bad device away uh, somewhere. Uh, from wiping out the spectrum for us. So I'm, uh, that's why I'll never put anything up too permanent here. I'm not going to uh, dig a hole and concrete a post in. I'd rather just use a fiberglass pole supported because I know one day probably I won't be able to operate at home. It's just how it's going to go, I, I think, anyway, sadly. Mm. Um, but I'm lucky that I can at the moment. So are you limited at all? To you? Can you operate at, at home at all, Hayden, on HF? Are there yeah. certain bands that you can use? Or? Yeah, so I, I can definitely operate from home. So 80 metres, uh, the the lower the, the HF band you go, the worse it is, which is usually yeah. the, the case. So 80 metres, uh, and I don't have the ability to operate 160, but I can listen there. 80 and 160 is about an S9 noise floor all the time. Uh, 40 meters varies up and down. So sometimes that's as high as S7 and sometimes as low as S3. Usually when it is S3, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, by the time you get up to sort of 20 meters, it depends. There is something that's around here that is, that causes a lot of carriers every sort of 10 kilohertz on the band. So you've got to try and work in between them. Um, other than that, the noise floor um, is pretty good on any other band above that. 15, 15 meters DX has been really good. Um, it's, been, it? it's been very right. quiet and I've, I've been working quite a few stations on 15 meters. Um, and a anything above that's usually pretty quiet, yeah. So what part of Australia are you in? Are you on the West Coast, the East Coast? Whereabouts are you? No, so I'm uh, the most southern state of Australia called Tasmania. Um, oh, wow, you're, you're Tassie. Oh, okay, I, brilliant. I, yeah. I am, yes. So uh, I am located in the capital city, which is the, right down in the south called Hobart. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's we're... Uh, we're a city of about half a, oh, sorry, half a million. We're a state of half a million. Uh, we're in a city of about a uh, quarter of a million, so about 250,000 people, yeah. Okay, so a decent-sized um, city, but not a lot else scattered around sort of thing then. No, uh, so it's sort yeah. of semi-rural. So it's it's not very far that you have to drive from the city. Anywhere that's sort of within 20 minutes of the city, you'll find somewhere rural and that you can set up portable especially. But we've got lots of hills. We've got lots of parks. We've got lots of areas where you can set up that's away from people that you can avoid that noise on on hf and and that's why we have also a lot of keen soda operators down here because we've got quite a uh, a lot of high mountains that are sort of you know over a thousand meters um some of the smaller hills over 500 meters so uh they're scattered around so yeah activity is pretty good down here wow that's good so some of the smaller hills are what you say 500 meters asl is that right that's a good yes. height isn't it yeah because yep. the hill, the, the largest hill I've got around here is about two hundred meters ASL. I'd kill to get on a five hundred <laughs> meter ASL. So I imagine for things like VHF, it must be a really fantastic takeoff point to get one of those hills. Then, well, it's it's a bit of a double edged sword because uh, where Hobart is, it's sort of uh, in the foothills uh, down down ah. below the mountains. So what happens is that because the mountains are all surrounding you, VHF and UHF doesn't get out as well as it it should. If you're on top of the mountain, it's great because you can work long distances and that's actually what we do when we do uh, VHF and above uh, contests. We go to the top of the, the mountains because we can drive there and we operate from there. But uh, as far as um, operating from down a little bit lower, it, it does make it a bit of a challenge, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah, it's great to get up a hill. I mean, I, I recently, no, last year, uh, September, October, no, August, September last year, we did a thing in the UK called 145 Alive. And this is, again, this is about working portable. Well, I took the flower pot with me, and basically we, we had about five or six of us on high ground around sort of the southern half of the UK, operating on five or six different frequencies on FM simplex on two meters. And uh, we literally just ran a, a net 
uh, on, on each one, um, but not like a normal net. I say a normal net where you have each person talking for two minutes and going back to the chair. This is more, dare I so swear on this on this uh, video, a bit like an 11 meter net, where, <laughs> um, which is my background, but my background is 11 meters. There we are, I've, I've admitted it. I think we um, have a lot of, actually, We uh, that's one of the things that we have here in Australia too. A lot of our uh, amateurs have come from CB and they've been operating oh, yeah. on 11 meters as well. So it's, it's, it's good to see a, a lot of uh, newly licensed uh, um, amateurs coming from those ranks. So yeah, welcome. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, brilliant. I mean, uh, and there's some fantastic operators now on, on, on Amateur come from CB, you know, and will continue to do so, I think. Um, so the, the style of net was basically more that uh, one person would be the chair. So I was the chair for one of the one of those frequencies. You have people calling in and you'll try and work them around each other and do it like that. And it worked really well. We got about 100 odd people who took part and a lot of people went up on high ground, especially for it, you know. So stuff like that works well. And I think Sometimes if people are able to, and this is the word able here, if people are able to, if physically able, financially able, commitment wise able to get out on a hill or just literally go somewhere quiet electrically, just drive into the countryside, pull into a lay by that's out of the way a bit, just put a little whip on the car, HF mobile whip or whatever it is. And it's amazing the difference to rest- I think people don't realize how much more it opens up the bands when you literally don't have any noise. Mm. Uh, I think we all think about, oh, do I have the gain? Can I get my signal out there? Well, in fact, you know, we forget, and I've been guilty of this, so we forget about the importance of getting away from the noise floor and just being able to hear people. Because it's the old adage, isn't it? If you can hear them, you have a chance to work them. But if, if you've got an S3 or S4 noise floor at home, and that's sort of... 5,000 kilometer DX is S2, S3, you're not going to hear them, even mm. even if you are able to get your signal out. But if you can hear them, you've got a chance, you know, and it does op- it opens up the bands. But I'm aware that people obviously sometimes don't have the opportunity or whatever to be able to do that. But if you can, you know, for the sake of a ham- $20, $20, 30 pound hamstick on your car, uh, and if you've got a little radio already and a battery, then just go out and give it a go. Because it's amazing what it can do for you, really. Yeah, and with the uh, uh, we talk about the uh, with noise that can present itself uh, with the ad with the um, what am I trying to say with the internet and with things that are progressing there too, it makes remote operation a lot easier too. So if you do have the ability, or if you do have a remote property or someone you know who lives remotely, that makes it even better because you can then pop a radio at their place, pop an antenna up at a remote location and you can take advantage of that low noise floor uh, 24-7 whenever you want to from the comfort of your lounge room. Oh, do you know what? I'd be the, that would be the holy grail if I could find some if I could find some person somewhere that I can say, look, can I just put my little can I put my radio, my PSU in your in your you know in your whatever your spare room or maybe even your garage because I noticed actually that you've got a very uh, small property and you've got lots of room and you live above. 500 yards of the sea is it possible i could do that you know yeah. <laughs> as part of me thinks i need i just need to get some dutch coach start knocking a few doors and say well, can i do that i'll probably get arrested but yeah. uh you know it's, it's one of those things and i think that's probably going to be a big thing moving forward more more, more, more people are going to go remote i know there's some big remote stations out there i think is it um is it ray over in the states having his uh, call now uh, remote ham radio there's a big thing happening there. There's a lot of people in the States oper- operating remote. Um, a lot of young people as well involved in the hobby operating remote. And I think that's a good way of doing it. And it's, as you said, there's plenty of software out now as well to allow that to happen. Uh, speaking of Callum, I know he's done it as well, hasn't he? From his uh, from his house down to where he used to uh, used to have his business down in the, the farm there. And it is possible to do it. You just need to be able to find the right location, you know. Um, but having said that, you know, you, you just buy a, ham- buy a, a, sh- a small whip. Twenty yeah. pound, twenty dollar whip. Um, people say you shouldn't use a mag mount on HF, but yeah, whatever. Twenty meters and up, you can put a mag mount on your car and just stick the whip on, tune it, and have a go. You know, it's about where you where you're located more than anything else. It really drives that. And I've had great success. I, I've hundred watts, probably not even that with a battery. FT eight nine one. I have a f- ten minutes drive from the sea. Um, yeah, I can work DX down there. Quite not, not easily, but I can work DX because it's quiet. It's a nice location. It's by salt water, and it just makes such a difference. I, I, I hardly work any DX at home, 
running 100 watts with full size antennas. You go somewhere in a good good location with no noise floor, with a smaller antenna, you work heaps more DX. I promise you, because of that's that's the effect it has. I'm the almost bit. evangelical about this, Hayden. I have to say to you, you can probably tell. Um, the the but, best um, antenna is the antenna that is currently up in the air. Oh, completely right. 100% <laughs> correct. Have you done a bit of HF mobile yourself? Have you tried that yourself on HF? <clears throat> so, I uh, I have I have tried HF mobile. Um, the the antenna I did have an 80 meter whip for a little while. It was actually a diamond uh, HX. HF uh, 80X, I think, was the model. Yeah, is it HF SX80 or something? It is. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. yeah, about two I, meters long or something. Yeah. yeah, and when you uh, tune it up, I think you literally get probably about 20 kilohertz of bandwidth on it, but it uh, it works. Uh, and I also had the matching 10 meter one. Now, uh, I uh, uh, filmed a video which was shown last week on the 25th of may i think it was was yes that was monday uh, that was monday night ham radio which detailed my mobile installation and uh and shows you what i've got installed there and one of the things i have in that is a ft8900 which is a yesu quad band radio and that includes 10 meters in it so i operate quite a bit of 10 uh, meters hf mobile on fm um, ah, and and right. and I've done that and, and working quite a lot of repeaters and also simplex and that's one of the uh, topics that we're going to discuss shortly too is is when sporadic e season opens up, is is that you can uh, work a lot of ten meter stations uh, on, during sporadic e. So I do uh, a bit a bit of that. Uh, I know that there's a couple of others uh, uh, locally in the area too. They operate sideband because they've got sideband radios in their car. And and uh, just the other day, a friend of mine worked. Uh, he was out in uh, in the Australian bush. Uh, he was driving around and he pulled over because um, one of the things about re- operating HF Mobile is, is that there is a lot of noise that gets produced by a car sometimes while it's running. And this was a diesel car as well. So he pulled over oh. on the side of the road on 20 metres and he worked VK0 in Antarctica on 20 metres. So uh, that was just from, yeah, from him driving around and uh, I, I actually was talking to him on... Uh, one of the 70 centimeter repeaters, and I said, uh, Antarctica's on 20 meters. Here's the frequency. And he dialed it up and worked him. So uh, he was quite happy brilliant. about that. Yeah, brilliant. Just shows you, you can do. Again, because he was somewhere quiet, he pulled yeah. up, there was no noise. Makes a difference. I, I never, I must say, I never actually operate whilst I'm driving. I just don't like to do that. Um, so I'm always, I'm always stationary. Uh, that's the way I like to work because I've got the mag mount and, it's, and the, the ham stick is about a eight foot high, it was like two and a half meter long antenna. So it's, you don't want that on a single mag doing 70 miles an hour down the motorway. That's probably not a very good idea. <laughs> um, but uh, when you're parked up, of course, it's absolutely fine. And uh, yeah, and of course, you know, uh, the other thing is as well, if you're going to put up a big pole to operate portable, you need to make sure you go and have a fairly quiet. Um, and uh, the, the, the C location where I go to, it, there's, a, there's quite a busy car park. So literally the, 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 the whip is, is where... Uh, what I need to do. And I still get a few funny looks, but uh, the whip yeah. is what I use um, to to use. And it, and it works really, really well. Now, you mentioned about sporadic E, yes. um, which is great. Now, uh, before I spout my stuff, sporadic E down where you guys are, obviously this isn't the right part of the, the season for you at the moment, is it, for sporadic E? So when does it kick in and what bands do you normally really focus on for that? Uh, so, so, so talking about sporadic E, sporadic E usually opens up uh, every single summer, there is a peak in uh, there is a very big peak in summer. So here in the southern hemisphere, that is November through to about mid to late January. Uh, that is uh, coincides in the northern hemisphere with what months is your summer peak? Well, we're, we're basically there now. So I mean, if really it kicks in around sort of early to mid April, although this year it started really late. We didn't really get a lot of openings until literally the last couple of weeks. May and June tend to be our peak months, but we'll still get openings July into August. Uh, but May and June are the two big months for sporadic year. Yeah. yeah. And so the bands that we're talking about here is, is it does affect some of the HF, the or mid to lower HF bands, but a majority of the time we're talking about 10 metres, 6 metres and 2 metres. Now over in the UK, you guys have got 4 metres, so it also would affect 4 metres as well. Yes, um, so we're sort of talking about that sort of, uh, that sort of um, 
uh, range of bands. Yes. Yeah, so what's that? Uh, around about four bands, roughly. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it does. It also has a, a, another effect on the on the lower bands as well, but uh, that's not quite the same. But you're right. It, it is mainly ten meters and up. I mean, uh, to give you an idea, yesterday uh, was just mad. Now I'll tell you how mad it was. On ten meters. Uh, usual range if there's absolutely no conditions whatsoever say you're in the depth of winter you want to speak to someone you're getting out and say you're on a hilltop with a quarter wave on your car you're probably getting out about 50 to 100 miles fair enough now yesterday on on 10 meters 10 meters was shocker it was like a, it was, you said it was a contest going on on 20 meters it was absolutely shocker and you had literally multiple qso's happening on the same frequency they couldn't hear each other but i could hear them mm-hmm. um and then we had it was all over europe so literally within sort of a thousand to fifteen hundred mile footprint it was mad uh, and then but but what also happens of course you then get the really short skip coming in what we call in the uk into g so I'm on the south coast of England, but I was sharing stations in Scotland, Northern Ireland, uh, Wales, and even within England itself. I mean, I was speaking to some guy who was literally 100 miles away, 150 miles away, who I'd never hear. He was five and eight to each other, but only for a few minutes and suddenly gone. So literally, that's, that's why, it's, of course, it's sporadic, isn't it? It just goes. Um, he was on about 28,420. On 28,430, there was a Canadian station on there, which is what three and a half thousand miles away. Got was that kilometers wise? I don't know. A five thousand kilometers. Five thousand. Yep. Yeah. So you had this mad situation where you had uh, not only short, really short skip happening, you also had the extended skip happening and everything in between. And um, for me, you see, when ten meters opens like that, it is my favorite band by some distance. I love it when ten meters opens. It's such a good band. And of course, the, as we said earlier, the advantage of it is even from home, you should hopefully have fairly much lower noise floor on 10, fingers crossed, than you would have, say, on 40 meters, for example. Mm. Um, now, a lot of people said yesterday that six meters was absolutely rocking as well. So six meters was wide open, up on 50 megs. And even you mentioned about the lower HF bands. Well, there were people reporting on 17 and 20 and certainly on 40, where again, that short skip was happening. So there were... 150, 200 mile QSO is happening on 17 meters, 15 meters, 20 meters, and 40 meters. So when you have really heavy sporadic E, it does have that short skip effect, even on the lower HF bands as well. So it's just so much fun. You know, we've had such a, a long trough over the last, um, you know, God knows, six, seven, eight years. It's lovely to have suddenly these conditions. I know it's sporadic E, it's not necessarily the, the 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 big rise of the sunspot cycle yet but to have that taste is um, is quite um gives a lot of hope for the next few years for hf certainly i think especially on the higher bands you know and it's uh, one of the things that i enjoy waiting for for the summer holidays is being able to work sporadically that's for sure Absolutely. i think from when the first at least the first five to six years I, I i was licensed 10 meters was definitely my favorite band as it was yours and then I kind of discovered six meters after that. <laughs> six meters. You know, I've quick. never, I've never been on six meters. Oh. I've never had a QSO on six. You see, oh, am I dear. missing out? Am I missing out? Tell me, am I missing I, out? I, 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 I think you are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so six meters for those who may not have operated on six before is is called the magic band for a few reasons, and and one of those is so ten meters is 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 a band that doesn't operate it doesn't open up as you say very often you have to wait for the sufficient sunspots to to appear so when we're going up as we are now in cycle 25 for the sunspot cycle as we start to climb up you'll start to see 10 meters will start to open more and more often and and when we're talking about often we mean worldwide contacts not just the the local stuff but every single summer that comes <clears throat> comes along, and as I as I said too, I neglected to mention that there is a small little peak in winter as well. So that comes and goes every single year. So here in the southern hemisphere, we're starting to go in towards winter. There is a slight peak in winter that's not as high as summer, but summer is the time when you really want to take advantage of these conditions. So ten meters is o- opens up uh, relatively uh, quite a few days during the the uh, the the summer sporadic key season when you get to six meters it's it's less so and it's also open not for as long but it can be quite rewarding sometimes some of the contacts if you're there when it actually happens and you and you're able to work them uh i've also worked sporadic key on two meters before which 
it becomes a real challenge. And as you start to see a correlation between the bands, as the, as you mentioned, so sometimes when the signals on 10 metres start to shorten and you get uh, contacts over, or oh, I'm trying to do it in miles, two to 300 miles, and it starts to shorten even more, 500 miles, then you can say that six metres is likely to open up to probably 1,500, 2,000 yep. miles, something like that. Uh, well, not 2,000, no, about 1,500 miles. And then when six metres starts to shorten, then two metres may possibly open up as well. So it's uh, something that's uh, really cool that you can, you can, I'll be tuning on the band and I'll go, oh, hang on, I can hear a VK, VK3 station on six metres. He's only... He's only uh, 300 miles. Uh, so I'm doing conversions again. 250 miles away. I better check. <laughs> I better check two meters just in case. So yeah. uh, it is. It is a very fun time to to be able to do that. And and uh, and as you say, it is sporadic uh, due to the the nature of the um, sporadic clouds just popping up out sure. of nowhere, and you just don't know when, when it's going to happen. But uh, but yeah, it is good fun when it opens up. That's for sure. Oh, for sure, it is, and uh, it's it's quite addictive. I mean, uh, I'm I'm at work, and uh, I've got oh. sort of phone. I've got the phone <laughs> with the cluster on. Don't use. Don't ever look at the cluster when you're at home. I know the cluster is is sometimes not not the be No, 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 no. When, I was when thinking, you're at work, what can you do? You when know? you're at work, is the worst thing because <laughs> oh, when you're at don't. work, and everyone is oh. working the DX, and you're the person at work who's sitting there oh, man. going. Oh dear, I'm missing out big time. Um, oh in, mate, oh it's dreadful. <laughs> and in actual fact, so you mentioned too that uh, the the band has has been opening up a little bit earlier this year. I over the last two weeks, I have been leaving while I've been at work. I've been leaving my system on at home on ten meters on FT8, and just seeing what I can see and what I can decode. And the other day, I was seeing plenty of US stations and also Hawaiian really? stations as well from here. Um, and I, I think that if I left it um, running, so obviously while we're talking at the moment, uh, it's about 10 to 8 at night and I think it's about 10 to 11 in the morning for yeah, you. that's right. So uh, as the sun starts to move across, uh, it's probably likely that I would start to hear some European um, stuff happening on 10 metres from here potentially as well. So I need to oh, start listening, pretty. I think. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, oh yeah. I mean, the the problem is, of course, is always, oh, I give another five, another five minutes, another five minutes, another five minutes. And literally, yep. oh my god. <laughs> so I've 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 as I've got a wife, I've got a daughter. So I've got to be careful. I've got to balance everything out, of course. But my god, uh, yeah. I mean, the work thing is just that's just literally torture. You're, you're looking at clustering and you go on to social media and say, oh yeah, ten is open. Oh, I've worked. Uh, I don't know. I've worked down into I don't know into Africa, and you're thinking, oh. God, don't tell yeah. me. That, you know. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell. I think one of the biggest phenomena I really enjoy, looking back at 40 meters, obviously you mentioned 40 is a very popular band with you guys, is the inter-G thing we get on 40. Now we get it every every year in the summer, and when we get on the sunspot cycle really kicks off, we'll have plenty of inter-G within the UK. That means basically working other places in the UK, you know, really short skip. And I'm I'm really looking forward to that because I really enjoy into G the short skip on forty. So if, literally, I, you know, speaking to people twenty miles away, that's how that's how good it can be. And you mentioned about the the winter peak for Spradic E. You're right. I mean, I was uh, it's January for us. It's January, um, so the second week of January, I think it was. And I noticed that ten meters was open. I quite what? I looked at my 7300 and there was some stuff on the scope, and you know, I thought, oh, great. And at the time, I had like a ninety-four foot, which is like a was that 28 meters or something long doublet up, which is a, a mad thing. It was bent all around the garden. It was low. It should never have even worked, but it did. It was a doublet, so I fed it with ladder line. I was able to get 80 meters up to 10. But I thought, I'll try it on 10 meters. It's going to be rubbish. But no, I was working stations on 10 meters. It just shows when the conditions, all about the conditions, when the conditions kick in, you can do so much with a, even a Frankenstein's monster antenna like that, uh, which we shouldn't really do much on the higher bands. So you're right. It's always worth checking out for the sporadic E, but don't it, it dominate your life. <laughs> I yeah. get you the sack because your boss sees you looking yeah. at the DX cluster every five minutes. <laughs> Or um, what's even yeah. worse is if you're sitting at work and uh, you do happen to have a remote station and you've got the headset on and you're going, oh, you're going no. CQ, CQ, <laughs> this is uh, Victor Kilo 7 Hotel Hotel. Does anyone copy? <laughs> and then you've your never boss done walks that, past. have you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, of course not. No, absolutely not. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. Yeah, it's so addictive, isn't it? But it's, it's, it's a fun part of the hobby. It's another part of the hobby. You mentioned FT8. I've never done FT8. That's something I've never done. So... 
and uh, maybe one day I'll learn CW. I don't know. I think a no. CW is the, is the holy grail for me. I'm not sure I'll ever have the time or the patience to do it. But I, I mean, exactly the same boat with that. I would, uh, and it's become a bit of a uh, a hot commodity, I suppose, because in years gone past, especially, I'm not sure about the UK because our, our licensing systems modelled now closer to what the UK's is or was. Um, but we used to have CW as part of our syllabus, but that was abolished quite a few years ago now. Yeah. So now people are starting to do CW because they want to, not because they have to. And right. I, I think that that's a good thing. And a lot of people are starting to take that on and having great fun with it too. That's brilliant. And again, you don't you only need about 10, 15 watts of power and you can work all over with CW, can't you? Mm. Um, I, yeah, that's a great thing. Oh, yeah, in the UK, we've got the three, got the three license structure at the moment, uh, foundation, intermediate and full. Um, which has been, believe me, such, such a hot topic of discussion as it probably is in VK as well. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, you might you've just read a forum. Some of us have a post saying, what do we think of the thread? I think, oh my God, there we are. It's going to be yes. a 200 <laughs> post forum, 200 <laughs> post thread for you and that's it, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, it's something I'd like to learn. I, mean, I, I, I want to avoid going down the road of maybe um, cheating. I use it. Well, I shouldn't say that word because people use it. But I don't want to use a computer. Do I want to do it properly? Uh, you know, learn it properly, use a key, mm. uh, and do it. But it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while, and probably again, time I need to invest in doing it. You know, well, it's like learning a le- new language, pretty much, yeah. isn't it? You, you, it is, isn't it? It's yeah. it's one thing to be able to it's one thing to be able to send CW, but then it's another thing to have to decode it. And and I, I know some people who. They'll either be able to, I think, is the term shorthand it, write it down? I can't remember if yeah, that's the right I think term so. or not. Yeah, I yeah, or the, yeah. And then there's yeah. another thing where people just sit there and they'll just listen and then they'll just reply. And I'm like, I don't know how you guys can do that's that. Amazing. It's just amazing how you can do that. It is amazing. The folks that can run like tw- over 20 words a minute, you know. Yeah, I don't know how they. I don't know how they do it. Frankly, so I, I take my hat off to them. It's it's a real skill, um, but it's something I'd like to do. But I guess that's going to have to be something probably in the future. For so, me. what's your furthest contact that you've had on ten meters before? Ten meters. The furthest contact I think is Argentina. I had that about two weeks ago with the whip by the sea. Uh, I've worked by Brazil. Brazil is a fairly because there's a lot of water between Brazil and the and, in, and Europe. So Brazil is a nice one to work. Um, I've worked the States once. Again with the whip, and yesterday I worked two stations in Canada, uh, in the afternoon in the UK. Again with the whip. So, when the conditions are in, you don't need a lot to to really work quite some distance on mm. on, on ten meters. I'm just looking forward to this new Sunspot Maximum that hopefully is going to come in a few years because that's going to make things a lot of fun on the higher bands. I think. Yeah. So am I. I can remember my my so my the furthest received signal that I've heard on 10 metres is the New York City FM repeater on wow. 29.620. And that come in, I think it was 2013, 2014, I think at the peak of the last sunspot cycle, which yeah. wasn't really that high anyway. Uh, but the but that, that repeater is quite distinct because it just sounds like a doorbell. Someone's ringing your doorbell. It's got a courtesy tone that sounds like that. That's so it. it's quite oh, distinct. Right. But my okay. my, I think my furthest and best contact was a guy in South Africa, and what happened was around about five p.m. local my time, I was tuning around the band and I heard that ten meters was open and I heard him calling and he was talking to a New Zealand station, and of course New Zealand's a little bit is more uh, east of where I am. It's about sure. uh, it's about fifteen hundred to two thousand kilometers east of where I am. Anyway, as the uh, evening uh, come along, and I think this was in this was in our summer, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was. I think it was in January. As it progressed along, the New Zealand station faded out to him, and he's and he finished up with him, and he started to get stronger to me. So I s- started chatting to him, and and this was about six p.m. at night, and I we talked for about half an hour, and we said, "Wow, the signals are so great here at the moment." I said, "Anyway, I need to go inside and have some some tea." So I went inside, had tea. I come back out at nine p.m. and I I I just thought I, I said to him, uh, "How long are you going to be listening on a frequency?" And he said, oh, "I'll be listening for a couple of hours at least." So I went back out at about nine p.m., gave a call, and he was still there on the wow. frequency. 
And I uh, and I spoke to him for a little bit longer, and I said, mate, I, I said, and I think I was out there till ten p.m. talking to him, and I said, mate, I'm going to have to go to bed now because, and and it was it was just great though. I don't know how long he was he was there for, but that's sometimes that's just what you get with some of the higher bands with ten meters. Just it just hangs in there for hours and hours on end. Absolutely, I just can't wait. And of course, you don't need big antennas, you know. Just uh, something like a cobweb, or but if you're lucky enough to put a hex beam up, or just be like a fan dipole with three or four bands on it, yeah. 10, 12, 15, and uh, you can have a whale of a time. So I'm really looking forward to that now. Of course, running portable, as we were mentioning earlier, small antennas, easy to deploy, and uh, it's, it's going to be great fun, I think. So yeah. uh, hope not put, I hope I'm not putting the, the, the mockers on it now by saying all this, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, hopefully it'll be, it'll be a good one for us. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the main point that if if uh, guys that are watching, if there's anything that you can get out of this, is just to have fun and uh, and and get out there and try some new stuff and absolutely and, uh, and and have a real go. Well, thank you anyway, Tim, for joining me today on uh, on the channel. It's been great to have you uh, t- as a guest on the um, on the second annual YouTubers Hamfest. It's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you and and talking about your antennas and all sorts of things. So I uh, really appreciate you being on today. Hayden, thank you very much indeed for the invite. It's been a pleasure to meet you. And uh, we've maintained a fairly good contact here despite all the distance, haven't we? So we've done quite well. Yeah. And uh, thanks very much indeed for, for the time and for the invite. I really appreciate it. No, it's great. And uh, for those who are watching, don't forget that you can check out Tim's channel. I'll put a link in the description below uh, to that. So uh, go and check that out. So coming up now on the YouTubers Hamfest, uh, we have uh, Callum, another UK... Uh, operator M0 MCX from the DX Commander. He will be uh, discussing, I think he's discussing vertical antennas, so definitely check that out. That will be in the playlist. Am I uh, pointing the right way? Yes, it'll be in the playlist here off to uh, the right. So uh, just uh, click on that and uh, and join Callum on uh, on his video there. So 73, everyone, thank you for watching. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, guys. And we'll thank see you. you again shortly.